I better start off by telling you where Ballantoy is, for those of you who don't know. Uh, it's on the uh, north coast of Northern Ireland. Uh, you see it there sitting in position with the, the west of Scotland. Uh, it's a very small uh, rural village, population of about 170. Uh, it's immediate hinterland around it, it's about the same. Uh, and I suppose the thing about it is, it's, uh, you saw from one of the slides that, uh, that Audrey showed, it's a predominantly uh, Catholic stroke nationalist area, but the community lives side by side. Uh, and part of the project was to address some of the issues through uh, local history and archaeology that would help address some of the wider uh, issues that's facing Northern Ireland uh, in, a, in, a, in a conflict resolution uh, environment. Um, it's famous, I suppose, because it's part of the main tourist uh, strip in Northern Ireland. It's close by the, the Port Heritage site, the Giants Causeway, uh, and uh, Cagaree Rope Bridge, which was a, a rope bridge between the mainland and an island uh, for salmon, for small scale commercial salmon fishing. But having those uh, sites which bring loads and loads of tourists to the area also has disadvantages. And one of the disadvantages being, of course, that the local sites, the less well known sites, tend to get neglected uh, and get forgotten about, and hence the title of our project, uh, Ballantoy's Hidden History. This is just a quick shot to give you an idea of what the physical uh, layout of Ballantoy looks like. Uh, the harbour here in the foreground, uh, I suppose, is really the bit that the tourists go to. Uh, very picturesque harbour, but was initially an industrial harbour. Young people now tend to think of it just as a, a nice place to go and paddle and play and uh, to go for the scenery, but really it was built as an industrial harbour. And then the village is set in the background, uh, so the harbour and the village is a sort of a split, a split settlement, uh, and the original village, as we'll see, was closer to the harbour. In terms of our society, Ballantoy Archaeological and Historical Society, we very deliberately uh, put into the title Archaeological. Uh, and the reason for that was that uh, we were very conscious that the, the bulk of the heritage or history work was actually being done in the area, was being done by archaeologists. Uh, I'm from a historical background myself, but I have to say the historians are still in the archives if, if, if they've left the university at all. Uh, they're certainly not uh, in the community. And I suppose given the nature of your professions, uh, you have to go out and engage with the community. And that was why we deliberately wanted to put archaeology into the title. History, as a most for the amateur like myself, is, is, is more accessible because you can go and get books and you can look up go to the archive. Archaeology is that little bit uh, more difficult for the, for the amateur to undertake. Our group is very diverse. Uh, I'm not going to labour the point. But uh, as you expect, with all your groups are the same. It's very diverse in terms of the educational attainment of people in the group uh, uh, and in terms of their social background. But the point I really want to make is in Northern Ireland, there's, there's this thing that we're, we think funding will bring groups together, and this is very useful for Prime and that and doing that. But in our case, our group came together organically. It's a mixed group, and everything in Northern Ireland boils down to your political background or your religious background, usually which are linked. But our group came together organically, naturally. There was no funding to bring our group together. Funding has helped take our group forward, but it didn't bring us together. But we were very conscious from the start that we wanted to do more than just have a monthly talk. We wanted to actually do projects in the, in the local community. And we were, from the start, very, very uh, determined that we weren't going to try and do this on our own, that we were going to engage with professionals, including academics. Some of us were fortunate enough to know some of them uh, prior to setting up the group. Uh, and, and that has worked really successful. And I suppose the first thing that we got involved in uh, was an archaeological, professional archaeological project at Dunluce Castle led by Audrey and Colin Breen uh, and John Raven has been involved in it as well. And they invited so many community groups to take part in that dig uh, and we were one of them. And it had a huge, that, that project has had a huge impact uh, on all the local groups in there. There's been an absolute upsurge in the growth of new groups and the strength of those groups. And a lot of it relates to what the professional archaeologists are doing in the area and involving uh, the local community. As part of that uh, sort of loose sort of relationship we were building with the academics, uh, uh, we got to hear about uh, through uh, to some of our colleagues at, at the University of Ulster first uh, about an HLF small grant program uh, called All Our Stories, which was run, run in 2013. Uh, and we were really aware there was like small grants for three to ten thousand pounds because although we had all these ambitions to do things rather than just be a monthly talk group, we never actually sat down and thought how are we going to pay for this, how are we going to do it? Uh, so this was like a godsend in, in many respects. But the key thing for it was that we weren't just applying for funding and having to do it ourselves. Through the uh, Arts and uh, Humanities Research Council, they were funding uh, researchers from the universities uh, to help the local groups do the project. Uh, and that was very, uh, very important for us. And we decided we would put in an application uh, the staff at the University of Ulster, which just happened to be positioned closer to our group, uh, helped us fill in the application form, uh, and we formed a little project group to do that. The project group initially, maybe there was six or seven of us on it, 
uh, not too sure at that time our group only had about 30 members. Um, I'm not sure if the other 20 or odd thought we were wise at the start. Uh, very tight deadline, but the application form for that HLF program, all our stories, was very, very straightforward. And with the assistance of people from the University of Ulster, the Centre for Market Archaeology, we got our application, we got our application in. And we decided uh, to focus on three um, previously neglected sites. Uh, and I'll talk with them in a wee minute. But when we were putting together the, the project, it was very different, I think, than what we initially envisaged because of the input uh, from the professional archaeologists and, and, and I'm sure people that worked with them. You know, we built up things like field trips, archival research, an archaeological survey, a community workshop, a guide of tours, blogs, websites, and a lot of sharing and telling the project as we went along. And we applied for, for £3,100. Now, this was a competitive process. Uh, we just didn't put in the application form and automatically expected we would get it. Uh, there was 30 groups in Northern Ireland applied. I know there was hundreds over the, the UK as a whole, but in Northern Ireland there was 30 groups applied and 17 of them were successful. Uh, and we were one of them. And we got uh, sort of word that we were successful towards the end of 2012 and then 2013. We were allowed to start it, but the project had a very tight uh, time scale and it had to be finished by the 31st of October. Uh, 2013, but in many ways that was a good thing because it kept it very focused. Uh, we decided to look at, at three sites, uh, the Plaster Church being the first one. Uh, this is, was a very good site given some of the things that Audrey has been talking about just earlier. Uh, this is a, a site with, which has two graveyards. Uh, one of the graveyards is called the Irish Graveyard and the other graveyard is called the Scottish Graveyard. And given the plantation of, of also that Audrey touched on, just the general movement of people between Ireland and Scotland, even before the plantation, the years before the plantation in the 1500s, and then much bigger part of the plantation in the 1600s. This sort of naming of these two graveyards in itself uh, summed up a lot of the things that, that we wanted to address in the project. Because we found out, yeah, I'm not going to talk, it's hard for me, I want to talk about the sites, and Eve has asked me to talk about the mechanisms. But uh, just quickly, you know, there's a, we found evidence of a 10th century graveyard. Uh, uh, 10th century church, sorry, and then this bigger image on the right hand side here of a medieval uh, later church. So it very neatly summed up what we were trying to do. The other site we looked at, of which there's very little physical evidence of above the ground, was Ballantoy Castle down near the harbour uh, here. Uh, we picked it because that named the castle, although the castle itself was not there, the castle as a distinct area within Ballantoy is still talked about. And it brought in the story of the Stuarts family who came from the Isle of Butte. Uh, in the 1560s, which is pre the official plantation, and of course, Freddie Antrim, strictly speaking, wasn't in the official plantation, but uh, it brings in that idea of, of population uh, movement from Scotland even before the official plantation at the beginning of the 17th century. Uh, and of course, also, you'll see a representation from a, a map there, it's called the Down Survey, it was published in the uh, 1560s. Um, there's a church on it, and that, that tied in with our other church site because that church was sort of the replacement church for the Plaster Church, so it linked the two things together. And then thirdly, uh, there's a big, big lovely beach uh, near Ballantoy called White Park Bay. And there was a story uh, that there was a large house. In fact, it's described in the Ordnance Survey members of the 1830s as a mansion. Uh, and all there's evidence of it now is this little stump of a building, uh, which has been used as a youth hostel and public toilets over the years. And we wanted to tell that story because, again, it tied in with the stewards. Local, a lot of local people, particularly local fishermen, never believed that there was a big house in that area. And of course, there was a local story that. Uh, the famous British Foreign Secretary, Lord Castlereagh, uh, had attended this school for a short time. So the Ordnance Survey member says that nothing very important, or nobody very important, ever lived in, in Baltoy. But there was this interesting little note, but there is a story that Lord Castlereagh went to, uh, to school there for a short time. So we've used those three sites because of their linkages. And I suppose it makes the point that um, in the graveyard of the sense, this view that the Irish, uh, uh, the native Irish, and then the English and Scott planters, that they lived separately. It was making the point that this wasn't the case exactly, but the problem was, was they were living side by side uh, rather than separately. So our project aims were very much to increase our awareness of the heritage that we would expect, but it really was about building the capacity of the society. At the start of the project, we had about 30 members. Um, most of them had never been involved in any historical projects before. We wanted to get more and more members of the community involved in the project, even if they didn't want to come to meetings, but at least take an interest in what we were doing. And also to start challenging perceptions because it is a mixed community, it is a mixed society. But a lot of the, the misunderstandings were based on lack of knowledge of each other's perceptions of what had happened in the past. And also to start to influence the local council where we live and other people who were making decisions about how our uh, heritage was presented. People like the National Trust, local councils, uh, but other groups as well. 
We launched the project on a very, very uh, cold, frosty morning uh, in February 2013. We did it at half ten on a Saturday morning, mainly because the rugby was on at two o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, <laughs> and this is a geographer from the University of Ulster, uh, Max Hope, who's very interested in how, uh, how projects like this and, uh, work within the community. He very kindly came along to uh, a project. You'll see there's quite a few young people there, and that was the core of the project theme at the start. And our project went sort of three main themes to it. Exploring uh, was the first one. Uh, I suppose you know, this was with Colin Breen, who uh, from the University of Ulster, who Audrey mentioned and works closely with, um, taking us to sites and teaching us that when we go to sites, we actually how to read the site, to look for different developments, when different things are built, different materials, look at the broader landscape. I think that was the bigger, the biggest impact that our members as a group that we learned was not just to look at the site itself, but actually to look at the landscape in which the site it, it was situated. We then did archival research. Uh, we went to the public record office. Uh, called the Scottish National Archives in Edinburgh. There uh, only is one in Northern Ireland, really, one main principal archive. But then we also use smaller archives. Uh, this one here was in the top right hand corner, was the uh, Northern Ireland Environment Agency in the centre of Belfast, uh, looking at their archives. And then we embarked on this very ambitious thing of doing an archaeological survey, which absolutely none of us had any experience of. Uh, and two of Audrey's colleagues from Queen's University uh, came down and helped us. Uh, undertaken trains a bit on how to conduct an archaeological survey. I suppose this was one of the great things about the project. Different people brought different talents to the project and different things that we didn't know other people could do. Myself, absolutely rubbish at archaeological survey, but we happen to have two guys in the group who are uh, who are a small builder, a building firm, and they were as good archaeological surveyors as some of the professionals, I think, uh, before very long they knew exactly. And that gave the confidence a great the project great confidence because all of a sudden people who maybe who were quieter about participating in the project started all of a sudden realised there was there was horses for scores and skills that they they could that they could bring to it. Put not a lot of emphasis on sharing what we were learning. Uh, there's a, a event every year, a vintage rally event in Ballantoy every year. So we to, we hadn't planned this in our original application. We took a stall of this and went out to start tell people about the project, and we were amazed at the at the uh, reception that we received. And then we held uh, like at the end of June. So there was a big, uh, a lot of things happened at the end of June 2013, a community workshop type weekend, kicked it off with a talk, uh, which one of Audrey's colleagues gave, Colin Donnelly from Queen's University, who happen, happens to be a native of Ballantoy, a professional archaeologist. Uh, and then we had a community workshop where we brought stuff along, laid stuff out to generate discussion, and we encouraged people then to bring bits and pieces with them, as we referred to, because we wanted to keep it low key. Uh, uh, and here we have a couple of our members, uh, stalwarts of our society, uh, taking, making a scanning, we did all the scanning on the day because people were reluctant to give things that they might not get back so we did it all on it and it had a huge impact uh, we weren't sure how it would go down and we held this event from 11 o'clock in the morning to half three in the afternoon uh, and we brought Roddy, um, first, uh, not Roddy, Roddy Reagan uh, from Kilmartin and our guide over to talk to us about similar projects that he'd been doing our guide a couple of us had been over there a few months previously and the, the, the members of the group when they heard that similar groups not that far away except this piece of water in between were doing similar things it gave us it gave us great encouragement and then, of course, the telling and celebrating. Uh, I suppose this is towards the end of the project, towards the end of 2013, and this is where we really, really started to enjoy ourselves. We, we had guided tours, uh, and then we come to the launch of our uh, traveling exhibition, the launch of our website. We've been running a blog throughout, though I'll speak a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, but when we came to have our celebratory event to launch the exhibition on the website, we had to move the venue three times. And that was because the, the, the first two venues weren't big enough. And so we unfortunately had to move it to a public house that had, that had a large, that had a large uh, so we tried two church halls first and they weren't big enough. Thank you. So, uh, and that was really the, the greatest thing, the greatest thing for the project was to see the actual community who maybe weren't directly involved in the project uh, uh, coming out and supporting us. The challenges, of course, you know, I'm talking all about the positive, of course there were challenges, like there were challenges about the self-belief, could we as a group do this, uh, how would we get on with the academics who were giving us so much support, and I'm pleased to report that we very quickly brought the academics up to our level, <laughs> <laughs> and, it worked, and it worked really, really well. Of course, we're keeping the project focused, and the IT bit of it at the start scared an awful lot of people, I see somebody's doing a workshop today in IT, and I think that's great, particularly things like blogs to some of us, uh, wasn't you, but... The support from the two universities, University of Austin and the QUB was invaluable and they ran fantastic uh, seminars uh, for us on various subjects in oral history, on using digital media, and we benefited greatly from us how to use photographs. The highlights of the project, I'm not going to focus very much on this morning, uh, because I touched on the first one, was about the society and, and, and community participation already, how it really, really took off. We ourselves were particularly proud of our archaeological survey drawings. 
uh, that we produced with the help of, of the two staff from two universities. But I think the main highlight we had was a series of architectural reconstruction drawings that we did. They were done by a guy called Philip Armstrong. Um, Philip works with people like Audrey and Colin all the time. He's a top-notch uh, illustrator of, of archaeological sites. Because one of the things when you involve the community is they keep asking, particularly young people, get up to what did they look like. We can see your description from the Ordnance Survey members, you can see your reconstruction, but what did they look like? So based on what we had learned, we got Philip uh, to produce these drawings and we put, turned them into posters, we turned them into postcards, all the usual things. And this was a real highlight to it. It's a bit of artistic license in some places. Uh, and we dispelled the myth in the bottom right hand corner that there wasn't a big house. We dispelled that totally, that's another total talk, but we dispelled it totally that there was a house on that, on that site. The highlights have come to the end. The highlights uh, for us was how it really built the confidence and capacity of the society. The project team when it started was about six or seven of us. By the time the project team ended, the project ended, I would say the project team consisted of about 22 people. And they just weren't 22 people on the fringe, they were 22 people who were totally involved. Uh, no matter what we went to do, they were one, they were doing it. The same in terms of the growth of the society. When we started the project, I would say there was about 35 people in the society. By the time the project ended, there were 70, 80 people in the society. And the interest that it generated in the community was enormous. We didn't get everybody from the community to come to everything, to go to all our meetings, whatever. Like but the influence and the conversation that stimulated from the community was enormous. And how we very quickly started to be seen as like not just an archaeological or historical group, but how we were starting to be seen in a, as a community group. And in fact, we had to resist to becoming a community group that we went to people who were going to organise the shopping trips to Belfast to Saturday before Christmas and that we were going to do, uh, to do sort of the historical stuff. But it's had a wider impact than that, a wider impact than that in the sense that we were looking at sites that resonated with some of the things that are still very much in existence in post northern Ireland conflict situation that we hopefully were in. Uh, about you know, the, the planter versus the, the native population type uh, situation. And really a lot of that was built around lack of knowledge uh, and uh, people not wanting to take time to listen to how it was perceived by the very common as the other side. As we saw the project developing, a number of things happened. Within our own group, there started to be discussions about things that were better based on more knowledge that made it up to them. The real sort of thing about Northern Ireland is that you avoid the difficult topics, you don't discuss them. Uh, or you rush up. But whenever you get to know, start to engage in a much more meaningful discussion, and there was an openness and there was a better understanding of each other's sort of perceived position. The other thing was to not only to build a relationship with people like the universities, we started to build a relationship with the National Trust, uh, as I've mentioned in other groups and some of the groups in the West of Scotland, but locally within our own area, we started to build groups with all our smaller heritage groups and we started to support each other. Van Toys in a predominantly Catholic area, a local group beside us who also did know our story, predominantly, but much very heavily Protestant area, and the two groups start to work together and continue to work together. So on, a, on, a, on the ground, it was having a huge impact and it's had a fantastic legacy, uh, and that, uh, a wider legacy, and that legacy is that the ambition of the group has grown in a ball proportion. The project's finished now about a year and we're starting to think about what we want to do next. We think we're going to do something on oral history uh, tied in with the industrial archaeology of Ballantoy. But I think really what we want to do is we want to build on sort of having like a heritage festival uh, and a heritage festival that's going to address some of the difficult uh, relationships between, you know, just to call it bluntly, Protestant Catholics National Unions within Northern Ireland. And one of those things, if there's one last point, is in 1641 there was an uprising in Ulster between the planters and the gales. And there was a, the, the Protestants were besieged in, in the castle that I mentioned earlier and the local church. And there was a Catholic priest who smuggled them in uh, wheat and water at Brother McLean. And we're going to try to build a historical sort of heritage archaeology festival around that, using McLean as the individual who sort of uh, brought the two communities together in 1641. That's our last slide. That's just us, a few of us, on the day that we put up a panel uh, at Tim Plaster Church. This, uh, sort of just summed up where we had come from. This site was very much neglected in the area uh, and we put a panel up this summer. The project was definitively finished, but really it's not really finished. The work has only just started and I hope it shows that what can be achieved with a little bit of money, a lot of help of the professionals, but primarily the enthusiasm of the local people. Thank you very much.